in the last two lectures to deviate from sort of the canonical uh, uh, series of lectures one might give on inflation. And instead of going further into details of how to calculate perturbations um, or of specific inflationary models, to talk about uh, challenges and controversies um, and possible research topics, uh, which I imagine a lot of people are interested in. So before I, I get into that, there's a few things which I do need to discuss um, that, I, that I didn't manage to get to in the, in the second lecture. Um, so in particular, what are the sort of primary observables that are connected to inflation? So the primary things you could observe in cosmology which are related to inflation the most directly. Um, and so we talked about how inflation is supposed to solve the flatness problem. And the way it does that is it uh, produces an omega k, which can be either positive or negative, because k can be either positive or negative, so let's put absolute value signs, which scales as e to the 2. So if you remember, by the way, the definition of omega k, it's k over a h squared. That's the definition. And so what we saw last time is that, um, is that omega k scales like e to the 2 times a number. I'll call it um, uh, n minimal minus n total, the total number of e folds of inflation. And we gave a kind of upper bound on n minimal, which was 62. <clears throat> so uh, what this equation says is that if inflation lasted a few more e-folds than this number, which is somewhat uncertain, but it's of order 62. Um, so if inflation lasts a few more e-folds than that, then the curvature is exponentially small. Right, so if inflation lasted even 10 more e-folds than minimal, then you have an e to the minus 20, which is a pretty small number, 10 to the minus 7 or something. It's way below anything we'll observe, we'll ever be able to measure. Um, so this was sort of the upper bound on n-minimal. Um, and it could be 50 in a somewhat more typical scenario. It's somewhere in this range, though, generally. Anyway, so that's um, so one of the observables in cosmology that's directly related to inflation is the spatial curvature. If the spatial curvature were large, that would be very informative. Or even if it's detected, uh, it's so it would have to be below the current observational limit, which, by the way, the current observational limit is something like a little less than 0.01. Oops, 0.01. That's the observational limit. Uh, so if we end up discovering that omega k is not zero, let's say 0 0.005 or something, then that teaches us something very important. It tells us that if, in fact, inflation happened, it only lasted a few more e-folds than this n-minimal value. So it didn't last very long. OK, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing is the amplitude of the power spectrum of scalar perturbations. So uh, we talked about how when um, there's a fluctuation in the inflaton, it gives rise to a fluctuation in the time at which inflation ends. Inflation ends when the inflaton reaches a certain value. And so if there's a fluctuation somewhere in the universe during inflation, which, say, pushes the inflaton towards its endpoint, then inflation ends early in that part of space. And if it ends early, it means the universe is effectively older. It reheated longer ago in that region, and therefore it's colder than the average. So we quickly worked out an equation um, for, uh, for delta n. That's the change in the number of e-folds. So first of all, this is h delta t. Um, and uh, we can rewrite this as h delta phi over phi dot. <clears throat> and if we use, um, and this is also, the reason it's interesting is it's the curvature perturbation. It's delta A over A. So it's the perturbation in the scale factor divided by the scale factor. And um, we can, uh, um, uh, if we know that delta phi is of order H, and here I'm going to put the 2 pi in, delta phi is h over phi, is uh, h over 2 pi. Then plugging this in, we have h squared over 2 pi phi dot. OK, and nor normalize this way. Um, 
This is the amplitude, it's, it's usually called delta S. It's proportional to the power spectrum of perturbations. Um, but it's the typical size in a, in a fluctuation in, um, in curvature. Um, <clears throat> now, how do you observe this? Um, so the cleanest way to observe these fluctuations is to look at the cosmic microwave background. So if this is T now, and this is us at Earth now, when we look at the, at the CMB sky, we're looking at light which reached us along a light cone. So we're seeing a back along this cone. And when we look at the CMB, what we're seeing is the state of the universe at this time here, T less scattering. Okay, this is T naught, T now. <clears throat> so CMB photons, for the most part, last interacted with anything at T less scattering which is a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So it's in the early universe. At the time of T last scattering, the universe was full of plasma, of ionized, um, ionized plasma, protons and electrons. Um, and after T last scattering, uh, electrons were captured by protons to form neutral atoms. And that's why CMB light stopped scattering. OK, so you can think of the universe before this time as a kind of opaque solid or not really a solid, but an opaque substance through which light can't propagate. So what you, what you see when you, when you look at the, at the CMB is, is simply you're just looking at um, this slice of the universe at that time. Okay, and then what do you measure? Well, you measure the temperature as a function of angle. So this is your sky. You look at, for instance, in this direction. You measure the temperature of the CMB. The CMB is almost a perfect black body. So when you look in a particular direction, you see a black body spectrum. There's a temperature associate, associated to that. So if we call this angle here n hat, then you measure T of n hat. And you do that for every point on the sky. And that's your CMB data set. Okay, so what does that have to do with this? Well, the temperature at this point um, is directly related to delta n at that co-moving point at the end of inflation, for the reason that I already described, that if inflation ends later, um, then the universe reheats later, and that point would be hotter. Okay, so there's a direct relation between the temperature at any point on the CMB sky and the fluctuation in the number of E folds uh, uh, at that point, at the, in that part of the universe. All right. Um, okay. So, One thing we can measure, given this T of n hat, <coughs> so given T of n hat, one thing we can measure is delta T over T. So this means T of n hat minus the average value of the temperature divided by the average value of the temperature. This is a quantity whose average is 0, um, but which has a non-zero variance and a non-zero standard deviation. And it's that standard deviation that's directly related to, to these quantities over here. Uh, again, re remember, delta n is another quantity with average zero. It's the fluctuation in the number of e-folds with respect to the background. Its average is zero. Um, and so the variance in that quantity, which is what I mean when I write this, I mean the, I mean this, the standard deviation when I write this equation, um, <coughs> That's precisely, very closely related to this uh, temperature fluctuation over there. OK, so we can do this. And um, we have more, I mean, so this standard deviation is, um, um, is a function of scale. All right, so why is it a function of scale? What does that mean? Well, when you, when you do this, um, uh, um, when, you me when you measure this difference on the sky, um, <clears throat> you can do it as a function of angle. So uh, if you'd like, you can measure the difference in temperature between two points, which are separated by some angular scale. So for example, you can measure the temperature here, and you can measure the temperature here. And you can see by how much they deviate, and then divide by the average. Um, and you can uh, take the average of that quantity across the sky. All right, so you can have a fixed angular scale here if you want. <clears throat> 
In other words, you can do a Fourier transform, you can do a spherical Fourier transform of this T of n hat and decompose it into modes. Um, <clears throat> and what you'll find is that the differences in temperature are almost the same. They almost, it almost doesn't matter what the angular separation is. Um, there's almost a scale invariance in, uh, uh, in the spectrum. It's almost the same amplitude regardless of angle, but not quite. Okay, so why is that? Um, well, if you look at this equation over here, um, I told you that during inflation, h is approximately constant. So h dot over h squared is small. So h is not changing very much during inflation. And the same thing is true of phi dot. Phi dot, phi satisfies an equation. Like this. And in slow roll, we can neglect the phi double dot term. So we can neglect it if this is small and if uh, eta, the other slow roll parameter, is also small. And then we find that phi dot is approximately v prime over 3h. And again, this approximation is valid in slow roll. And neither of these quantities is changing very much during inflation. So phi dot is also close to constant during inflation. Okay, so this ratio here changes a little bit during inflation, but not very rapidly. So what does that mean? It means that these perturbations, um, they're generated as inflation proceeds. And they have almost the same amplitude um, as time passes, but not exactly. There is a slight change in their amplitude. And the way that's usually characterized is by what's called the tilt, the tilt of the spectrum, defined like this for some sort of historical reason. Um, like this, where uh, k is the momentum. Um, so imagine, um, to make it even easier, forget about what we can see for a moment, and suppose we could measure the temperature of the universe everywhere on some sort of slice at, at this time, t last scattering. So suppose we know the temperature everywhere. We know t of x at, at t last scattering. Then we can just do a linear Fourier transform of this. Um, and we'll have T of K. Uh, we'll have a power spectrum for T of K. That's what this delta S here is. So uh, this derivative means with respect to that K. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is the way uh, the tilt is defined, and it can be inferred from this data we have on the CMB sky. Um, and we can compute this derivative using slow roll equations. And uh, that's the result, where um, I should write it somewhere over here, epsilon 1 half prime over V with an M plank sitting here. And eta is M plank squared V double prime over V. These are these same two slow roll parameters we defined last time. Remember that 1 over 8 pi g is m Planck squared. OK, so these are these two slow roll parameters we defined last time. And so what we find is this, is this uh, logarithmic derivative of the, of the power um, is a small number in slow roll. And again, the reason for that physically is just that nothing much is changing during inflation. Inflation is almost static. The physical quantities, h and phi dot, v and so forth, don't change rapidly during inflation. So think of inflation as a kind of a stationary phase, almost, with just a gradual decrease. Um, well, it doesn't have to be a decrease, but a gradual change in, uh, uh, in the physical quantities that parameterize it. So there's a gradual shift in the power spectrum um, <clears throat> uh, over time. You might wonder why it's d log k that we're taking here. Yes? 
possible, you're right, I didn't derive this directly in my notes, but I did check that it works for, so you think it should be six epsilon minus two eta? Uh, that would not give the right answer for, the, for at least one case. Six, you think it's six epsilon minus two eta? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that would give the wrong answer for, uh, at least for this model, so I, I don't think so. Uh, well, let, let me come back to that. I, I have not derived it in my notes. I, this I took from a review. Uh, so perhaps there's a typo or I made a mistake, but I, I think, well, 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 we'll compute this in just a second for one model and we'll, and we'll see if the answer we get is reasonable. Um, okay, so uh, in any case, it's proportional to these slow roll parameters, so it's small. Right, so now why is it, um, why is it d by d log k? Um, <clears throat> it's because of the exponential growth in the scale factor. Remember that a during inflation um, is some um, A initial times E to the HT, H inflation times T. And what this means is that um, uh, if you generate a perturbation on some scale, that scale grows exponentially for the rest of inflation. So K, the corresponding uh, momentum, decreases exponentially. And so when you take D by D log K, you're basically taking D by DT. Okay, so K goes as some K initial times e to the minus ht. And so when you take d by d log k, it's like taking d by dt. And that's how you can compute this. I'm not gonna do it on the board because it'll take some time, but that's how you would derive this formula or whatever the correct version of it is. Uh, okay, ah, that will give the right answer. Yes, that will give the right answer. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, good. Yeah, for, for phi squared, these are, these are equal, so uh, you can't distinguish that formula from the other one. Um, okay, very good. Um, yeah, so, so let, let's actually compute them. Let's compute epsilon and eta for the model that we, that we discussed. So the model we discussed was uh, V of phi is one half m squared phi squared. So epsilon is one half V prime over V squared. Uh, and, so, um, uh, and so this is gonna give us two um, Planck squared over phi squared. Eta is V double prime over V squared. And uh, so this is just going to give us, oh, I forgot, uh, no, that's correct. Uh, this is going to give us two m plex squared or phi squared as well. So for this particular example, eta and epsilon are equal, which indeed is why uh, the other formula gave the right answer. Um, so if we compute minus six epsilon plus two eta, we're gonna get minus eight plex squared over phi squared. Okay, and um, you'll recall probably that uh, last time we derived a formula for the number of e-folds as a function of phi. The number of e-folds was proportional to phi squared. Um, and if we write this in terms of the number of e-folds, it's minus two over n. So this is a, maybe a nicer way to express it. And this n, remember, is roughly, well, um, uh, this n changes during, during inflation. That's, that's, um, that's the fact that uh, inflation is not, exactly, um, is not exactly constant in time. The quantities are changing slowly. But the part of inflation that we observe when we look at the CMB sky is the part that's close to this number n minimal. It's the, it's, it's the, um, it's the part that, that was produced um, sort of as far back as, as, as we can see in inflation. Anything that was produced earlier than that is outside our horizon today. And anything that was produced much later than that um, has a much larger value of K, according to this formula. And so it's not gonna be in the CMB. It's gonna be uh, in large scale structure or even on a smaller scale. Okay, so we should plug in N of order 50 or so, 50 or 60 into this formula. Um, and so this gives us something like minus 0.03 or so. In other words, NS, is approximately 0.97-ish, right, somewhere around there. 
Um, good. Okay, so uh, this is another observable of inflation. So there's the amplitude of the power spectrum, and I should have told you what it is. Um, so this is roughly a few times 10 to the minus 5. Um, <clears throat> that's the standard deviation. Power spectrum is the square of that. That's the standard deviation uh, in fluctuations in temperature. Um, and then there's the tilt. So that's the degree to which this changes, d log delta squared d log k, as you change the scale. And this number, in fact, is roughly correct. In other words, it's, uh, it's roughly what data seems to indicate um, is the correct value. So those are the two of the several of the primary observables in inflation. And then let's, let's talk about just one more, and then we can go ahead to discuss the objections that people raise. Um, so the last one, the last observable I want to mention is um, <coughs> the amplitude of tensor modes. So you may remember BICEP2 announced that it had detected primordial gravity waves. It was very exciting. Um, and then it turned out, in fact, it detected polarization due to dust. Um, so it was not primordial. It was a, a foreground, a, a sort of a systematic error or a, a foreground that needed to be subtracted um, if you wanted to, uh, to measure what was behind it. Um, and the reason this was so exciting is that uh, inflation doesn't only generate fluctuations in the inflaton phi. It would generate perturbations in any massless field or any field whose mass is less than, than the Hubble, roughly. Uh, and so in particular, it generates perturbations in gravity, in the metric. And uh, fluctuations in the metric have a tensor structure. So you've heard now a lot about gravity waves. You know that gravity waves have two polarizations. Um, so inflation excites those gravity waves. It, it, um, it perturbs the metric in such a way as to produce gravitons with those uh, polarizations. And you can distinguish the imprint of those fluctuations on the CMB from the imprint of these scalar perturbations that come from fluctuations in the, in the inflaton. So I'm not giving you the details, I'm just telling you the bottom line, that there is a power spectrum of perturbations in the metric. H is a metric perturbation. And it has a simpler form than the scalar perturbations. The scalar perturbation power spectrum, which is written over here, it depended on phi dot. Right, so it was h over phi dot times delta phi. Delta phi is universal. It's just of order h. But phi dot can be very different in different inflation models. Tensor perturbations, on the other hand, um, only depend, the amplitude only depends on, um, uh, on h and f link. You can write it like that. So this is sort of like the fluctuation, and this is the thing that, uh, uh, that normalizes it. Um, okay, so, so, um, so there's power in these tensor perturbations. You can distinguish them from the scalar perturbations. Um, and people usually express this in terms of what's called R, which is the ratio of the power spectra, and that's 16 epsilon. Now, um, Data tells us that R is less than about 0.08. So there's only, at most, 8% as much power in tensor perturbations as there is in scalar perturbations. And um, this number is not quite consistent with the epsilon that we would have had over here. Uh, so this is minus 4 epsilon. Um, so um, epsilon is a bit less than, than, than 0.01, um, and that means that 16 epsilon is something like 0.14. Okay, so for that model, for m squared phi squared, epsilon is roughly 0.01, and therefore r should be about, it turns out, a little less than 0.16. It's something like uh, 0.15 or 0.14. And that is um, incompatible with this, with this bound. Okay, so, so this is actually a model which is ruled out by observation. Now, <laughs> um, 
that might give rise to, to various reactions. I mean, you might wonder why I'm telling you about it if it's ruled out. Well, the answer is it's, it's a very simple model. It illustrates all of the relevant physics. And it was only quite recently that it was, it was ruled out, so I think it's perfectly fine to sort of learn from it. But another reason I did this is because one of the criticisms of inflation is that it's not falsifiable. And in fact, um, here you can see very easily that this sort of simplest model of inflation has in fact been falsified, has been ruled out by um, the lack of uh, observation of tensor power. So um, we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. Um, right. All right, are there any questions about this? We'll come back to that. Yeah, that probably is what they mean. Yeah. How exactly is? Yeah, sorry, you don't exactly, you don't know how which form, say, say it again, which formula? I wouldn't understand. Say it again. The index? I don't understand it from the drawing. N hat. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, good. Okay, what is N hat? Um, good. Right, so, so let, me, let me make this more clear. So, so this is supposed to represent time. And uh, because I'm not very good at drawing, I'm drawing something which is like a two spatial dimensional universe. Okay, so, so um, if you live in a, um, uh, if you live in a two dimensional universe, then um, you can look around you, right? You live in a plane, so you look around you at some, at some angle. That's what this n hat is supposed to represent. So there's some theta here. n hat is a unit vector that's just at angle theta with respect to some, um, to some uh, x-axis. And, um, and so different n hats just represent different directions that you're looking. Okay, in, 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 uh, in our actual universe, which is three-dimensional, there's a theta and a phi. n hat is a unit vector on a sphere. It's just pointing towards a particular location on the sky. And so it corresponds, a particular value of n hat corresponds to looking in a particular direction. When you look in a particular direction, you're seeing light, which came from that direction. And if it didn't scatter all the way back to last scattering, then it originated at this point down here at the, on the last scattering surface. Does that make sense? So, so think of the last scattering surface. It's not a surface because we're in three dimensions. It's a volume. And the CMB sky is a spherical slice of that volume. And what you're measuring, when you look at the CMB, what you're seeing is the temperature on that spherical slice of the universe at the time of last scattering. Okay, so n hat is just a, a vector that points to a particular point on the sky. Okay, um, other questions? Uh, okay, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. This, this relation here is not general. The fact that this ended up being uh, minus two over n. It's not exactly specific to m squared phi squared, but it would be different for, for some other models. Yeah. Uh, so w when I calculate, I don't really calculate n total. I, c I can't calculate that unless I measure a mega total. So if I, if I could measure a, a mega, not a mega, well, a mega k, if I could measure spatial curvature, then modulo the uncertainty in precisely what this number is, um, I would know what that is, right? In particular, I would know the difference between these two. And there's not that much uncertainty here. It's only logarithmically sensitive to various things like the reheating temperature and so forth. So if I, if I ever measure spatial curvature to be non-zero, then I will be able to say what this is. If all I can say is that the spatial curvature is less than something like this, then it, it gives me some bound that this difference must be larger than something, but it doesn't tell me what n total is. Right, so inflation could have gone on for a million e-folds, and all I can see are the last 60, basically. Right? So the amount of it I can see are the last n minimum. <laughs> 
whatever that is, 60-ish or so. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, good. Okay, so, 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 um, so let's get to the juicy part. So let's talk about the uh, controversies and problems. Um, well, first I should say probably what does everyone agree with? Everyone that I know. So um, I think everyone agrees that if you're given suitable V, so this means in particular that epsilon and eta are small, um, and so oh, and that n is greater than 60 or so, so the number of defaults calculated from that potential is sufficiently large, um, then everyone would agree that inflation can occur. Um, and if it does occur, it'll produce a quote unquote good universe, which means flat, homogeneous, that has a, uh, a good spectrum of perturbations. So perturbations as described over there. Described over there. Okay, so, so, um, so I think there's no, uh, there's no debate over sort of the mechanics of, um, of anything that I've told you so far. Um, so that's one thing. And the other, um, is that given suitable initial conditions, uh, inflation will occur. Okay, so that I think is is uncontroversial. For instance, an example of suitable initial conditions would be that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic before inflation, and the value of the inflaton is somewhere on the inflating part of the potential, and the time derivative of the inflaton is not too large. Okay, so in our m squared phi squared toy model, there's v of phi versus phi, You'll recall that there was a region in here where there's no inflation, where epsilon is greater than one. Um, this was something like root two times m Planck. Um, so suitable, one example of suitable initial conditions would be phi takes a value somewhere over there, and phi dot equals zero, or it equals the slow roll value. Okay. Then no one would dispute that this universe will inflate and all this stuff will follow. So if we start here, and phi dot initial is equal to zero, let's say. Okay, so that's, um, um, right, that's, that's, that's hard to argue with. Uh, okay, but it's not very satisfying because at least if those were the only initial conditions that would give rise to inflation, then it would not be very satisfying because um, you don't want to have to assume that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic before inflation. The primary, the thing we started with, the sort of main point of inflation as a theory is to explain why the universe is so homogeneous and also so flat. I should probably have said that, um, let's say it's a flat universe, <coughs> um, that that's part of this initial condition. So you want to explain why the universe is flat, why it's homogeneous and isotropic. You don't want to have to assume that in order for inflation to begin. That would be a circular argument. So, um, what are the criticisms? So one of them, um, I'll come to this question of initial conditions in a moment, but one of them is, I'll just shorthand, tuning of the potential. So, um, I'll explain, I'm going to explain all of these in, in some depth uh, in a moment, but let me just make a list of the four that I'm going to discuss. 
Um, another one is that that it's unpredictive because there exist, backwards E means there exist, many inflation models. Many V, if you want, many models, many different models. Okay. Um, the third one is this issue of the initial conditions. Are they tuned? And um, the fourth one, which to my mind is the most interesting, is the problem of eternal inflation. And the measure. Okay. Um, all right, so, so let's see uh, how far we can get with these. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so let's start with this, this issue of tuning of V. So, so what does this mean? Um, so... Uh, we, we've said that, that, uh, that you have to have a suitable V, meaning epsilon and eta have to be small. Okay, so, so um, both epsilon and eta take the form of M Planck to some power. Yes? Oh, I'm, uh, uh, these four, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss them one after another. Why? Why? Uh, th these are... Th these are, uh, let's say, challenges to inflation. Okay, yeah. Um, right. So both epsilon and eta um, take the form uh, m plank to the n. Um, nth derivative of phi times v <laughs> over v. And um, you want this to be, um, well, you want this, let's say, to be much less than V. Now, um, if your inflation model has the characteristic that phi is much greater than M Planck, which we saw was the case for M squared phi squared. If you'll remember, in M squared phi squared, phi needed to be about 15 times M Planck or so. We had some discussion over that. Um, so if that's the case, then this is really not very problematic. Um, in other words, you could just have, so then it's okay for, say, dv by d phi to be approximately simply v over phi. Okay, and you don't have an issue. So for example, for any monomial potential, that's, that's the case. Yeah. Why do I require it for all n? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really, uh, it's enough um, that uh, v prime and v double prime are small. Um, I mean, if you had some higher derivative that was enormous, I think that would probably cause a problem, actually, because it would mean that eventually something gets large. But uh, um, you normally assume some kind of smoothness on v. So, yeah, I mean, th 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 there's, uh, yeah, let, 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 if you want, let's just restrict to n equals one or two. Um, so if, if, phi, if phi is bigger than M Planck, um, then, uh, yeah, that, that, then there's no, uh, you, don't, you don't require any sort of feature in the potential. You can have, for example, M squared phi squared, or any single power will work just fine. Um, there's no problem there. Um, <clears throat> you might still wonder how you got that potential in the first place, but, um, but certainly there's no um, sort of extra feature that needs to be put in. However, if, uh, if phi is much less than M Planck, then uh, it's not okay. So then dv by d phi um, must be much smaller than v over phi. And so you need something like, 
you know, that. You need some sort of feature where V prime is small, a plateau of some sort. So, um, right. So one form of tuning of the potential that you can complain about uh, applies in this case, where, um, where phi is much less than M Planck. I think I said before, models where phi is bigger than M Planck are called large fields. And, uh, and conversely, models where phi is much less than M Planck are called small field. And it's also the case that large field models have large R, relatively large R, and small field models have relatively small R. And since there's now some observational pressure on um, the simplest of these large field models, as we, as we said, m squared phi squared seems to be ruled out, uh, well, um, it doesn't mean that we're well into the small field regime. We can certainly be somewhere on the border, but, um, but the data is starting to disfavor some of these large field models. So that's one thing you can say about it. Um, there's um, another complaint that's sometimes made. Um, so sometimes when you have, and I wouldn't say this is very general, but sometimes when you have these plateau models, so there's some region of the potential which is a small field model. But when you write one down, you sometimes find that there's another region of the potential which is a large field model. Okay, so in fact, the same potential may have two regions, one of which is a small field model of inflation and one of which is a large field model. And which one happens depends on the initial conditions. Okay, so for example, in this picture, let's make this very steep here. So here you don't inflate, here you do, here you don't. But maybe over here, this is just m squared phi squared. Okay, so you might have a large field model which would describe inflation if the initial condition of the field is over there, and a small field model that would describe it if it's over there. And then another criticism that's sometimes made is that these large field models tend to have a large number of e-folds. A large number of e -folds. And if you have a large number of e-folds, you produce a lot of volume. And so maybe that's more probable. Okay, so this is another criticism that you'll sometimes find, that nature seems to prefer, in that sense, these large field models, but the data is starting to put pressure on them. So, um, how should we do this? Should we go through, should we go through the criticisms and then I'll tell you my view, or should I tell you my view as we go? That's uh, uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard to resist. Huh? Yes. Yeah, so how do you compare infinity to infinity? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, we're, gonna come, we're gonna come to that when we come to item four here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not obvious how to do it at all. I completely agree with you. Um, but the universe could be finite. Um, okay, well, I think, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, so one at a time, because I'm not sure we're gonna get through all four of these today. So let me, let, me, let me tell you as I go what I think about this. So for this one, so first of all, for the tuning of the potential itself, um, it's really unclear how much of a problem it is for two reasons. One is that the data has not actually put very much pressure um, on these large field models in the sense that M squared phi squared was only ruled out by about a factor of two, right? So it predicted R to be roughly twice the observational bound. And um, so it doesn't require a very, a very big change to evade that. There are a number of ways. Um, you could modify m squared phi squared to evade it, or you could simply consider a different potential, um, which would look roughly the same and would still be large field. It would still have phi larger than m Planck, but um, predict a, a value of r that's consistent with this. So it's not like there's some you know, really, really strong bound that tells you that you cannot possibly be in this regime. So that's one reason why this is not a big concern or at least not, not yet. Um, the other is that how much you should worry about having features in the potential like that, 
After all, the standard model of particle physics is full of small dimensionless parameters, right? It has some uh, tiny Yukawa couplings in it. Um, it has lots of stuff in it that isn't very minimal or very simple. So uh, it, it's not very clear how much you should really worry about that. Um, I think you, sh you should think about it, but, but whether it should cause you to throw the theory away, maybe not. Yeah, did you have a question? So, just a quick question. So, if I superplanking, mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so 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 I I didn't write. There, there's a um, yeah something called the lift bound, which directly relates the range of phi to r. Um, but this this value of r doesn't yet tell you that the range of phi is subplankian. You also have to be careful whether you're talking about the reduced Planck mass or the Planck mass. This sometimes get, but it doesn't tell you that the range of phi is below the reduced Planck mass for sure. It's not even close. Um, Anyway, it, it, it's a question of order one factors. So it, it's, it's not like there's some sort of um, uh, really sharp bound there. Um, okay, so, so that's one, one response. The other response, which I can't resist uh, telling you, is, is just sort of a specific model, which um, I think serves as something of a counterexample to this worry. Uh, so um, just consider the following V. So this is a function of many fields um, where I it was one up to n, so there are n, this is a multi-field model of inflation. And the potential is a function of all of these fields. I'm gonna write it like this. So, um, what is this crazy thing? Um, it's a sum of um, periodic functions of these phi's. These q's you could take to be plus one, minus one, or zero. And these lambdas you could take to be some very high scale, like maybe the gut scale, so a few orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. Now, um, why do I mention this? Well, it turns out that, um, the, uh, that this, this kind of a potential has a very complicated structure. It has a huge number of local minima. It has of order, if P is, is bigger than but not much bigger than N, then uh, it has roughly the square root of N factorial distinct minima. That's a very large number. And it has even more saddle points of all types. Right? So when you're living in N dimensions, a minimum is a point where the first derivative where the gradient vanishes in all directions, and all the second derivatives are positive. Right, the, the eigenvalues of the Jacobian are all positive. And a saddle point is a point where some of the eigenvalues of the Jacobian are negative and some are positive, and a maximum is where they're all negative. So there's lots more saddle points than there are minima, because there's a lot more ways to make, say, one of the eigenvalues negative than to have all of them be positive. So there are, there are this many minima, there's something like n choose little p saddles with p negative modes or something like this. Okay, so. Why is that important? Well, um, this is something like a saddle. I drew it in one dimension, but it's a little bit like a saddle. And so, <coughs> in a model like this, you have an enormous number of um, flat regions, which are, um, which m most of which might not be suitable for inflation, but, but some of them will be. And if you just randomly scatter your starting point, in this landscape. So you just take this field space here and you just pick random points uniformly. And you only keep the points which give rise to enough inflation, 60 E folds. And you make a plot of R versus NS. You find points everywhere. So this is a logarithmic scale. Um, so this is something like one, uh, zero, or one minus one, minus two, minus three. And this is 0.8. 9, 1. You find points all over the place in this plot. Actually, more than just in this range. In other words, there are all different sorts of inflationary trajectories, some of which have tiny r, so they're small field, some of which have large r, so they're large field, some of which have really big tilts, I mean, tilts that are totally ruled out observationally, some of which are in the nice range, which is in here. Anyway, there's, there's lots and lots of points filling the space. 
So this is not the way people usually think about inflation models. Historically, people have sort of considered one model at a time. They took m squared phi squared because, well, that's the simplest thing you could think of. And then lambda phi to the fourth, that was the next one, and so forth. Um, okay, so this is a different way of doing it. Take a model where we randomly choose the parameters. It's got lots of fields, so it has a, a big configuration space. And you immediately find this huge variety of different inflation models. Um, some are small field, have small R, some are large field, have larger. You can get almost anything, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, I think this just shows that it's not, it's not at all clear that there's any tuning that needs to be done to find small field models. I should have said that uh, you can choose these randomly and you can choose these randomly. Um, you can also choose the kinetic matrix for these fields randomly if you want. It doesn't change anything very much. And so there's no, there's no tuning or, or anything like that. Um, I promised to provide some research opportunities, so here's one. Maybe I should write them. Nobody cares, but everybody agrees on, so let me erase that part. And uh, I can write some research opportunities up there. It's boring when everybody agrees. So I think one interesting thing to do is to study models like that. multi-field random models of inflation. And in particular, one, uh, one thing that has not been done is to study non-Gaussianity, which we did not discuss, but uh, it's interesting because these trajectories, especially the ones with small r, tend to take turns. They're not, in other words, they, they go around curves. They're not in straight lines. And this will lead to, uh, to interesting sig signals. Um, Okay, anyway, so that's, so that's um, I think that's one way of looking at tuning. If you, if you choose everything randomly, and the average of everything is, you know, the gut scale, you can't really be accused of tuning anything. Uh, but, but, um, but you still manage to find a big variety of inflationary trajectories. Okay, which brings us nicely to the next one, that it's unpredictive because there are many possible potentials. And those different potentials give uh, different results. M squared phi squared gave us um, gave us R, which is now ruled out, and a particular value of the tilt, which is about right. If we'd studied other models, we would have, would have gotten different values for, for R and NS. Um, and here you see a model that gives lots of different values for them, depending on where you start. So uh, how big of a problem is that? <coughs> um, so uh, for a while, it seemed like neutrinos might be massless. And then, um, through various means, through the sun, the presence of neutrino oscillations and so on, it became more and more clear that neutrinos have mass. We still don't know what the masses are exactly. We have various constraints. So uh, the standard model of particle physics with all neutrino masses zero was falsified. And it's now been replaced by a new model in which neutrino masses are not zero, but we don't know exactly what they are. No one's worried that that means that quantum field theory is unpredictive. No one's worried that that means that the standard model is not a good theory or something. That's total nonsense. Really, you have some class of quantum field theories. You collect data, and you zero in on the one that correctly describes your data, and then you try to test it and see if you can zero in even more. So maybe it would be fair to say that we didn't know what the neutrino masses were. There were some constraints. We knew they were light, but, and with data, we zeroed in more um, on those. But really what people did actually is add the new parameters you need to add um, to take into account neutrino, neutrino masses when it was shown they were non-zero. So, you know, in, in, that, in that analogy, if someone asked you, is quantum field theory falsifiable? Okay, maybe. You could maybe think of something. But there's a huge class of quantum field theories and they all make different predictions. So it's really hard, uh, it's really hard to find something which would falsify all of them. And that's not what you mean when you say a theory is falsifiable. What you mean is that you have a specific theory and it makes specific predictions which can be tested and you can throw it away if they don't match experiment. So by that standard, inflation is certainly falsifiable because any specific model makes very specific predictions for NS, for R, for the tensor, amplitude of tensors, et cetera. And um, we can see that in action. We've already ruled out the one I used as an example, M squared, phi squared. So um, 
I think, you know, this is a bit philosophical, but, but, but I think it's, it's important to say in this context that, that you know, it's, it's, it's a big ask to try to rule out an entire class or a whole paradigm. It's not very easy because these are big, kind of ill-defined, vague things with lots of theories. And, yeah. Yeah, it, no, it's a good question, and uh, I'm going to come back to it next time if that's okay. I'm going to talk about trying to build inflation models from the top down. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the vast majority of the literature totally ignores that. It just deals with classical plus small perturbations around the background. Doesn't worry about renormalizability, doesn't worry about anything. Um, you know, people deal with, uh, with models with very high powers of phi, and it's just sort of, uh, or, or, I mean, what's a little bit sort of more, um, well-grounded is to look at just effective field theories of inflation where you explicitly don't worry about the UV and you just write down the most general effective field theory you can. Uh, you know, but but um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that sort of question in the next lecture. Um, okay, so, so, so um, what was I saying? Right, anyway, so, so yeah, so I think falsifiability, it's really, um, it's really something you should think about in the context of a specific individual model, not some big class. Um, right, and uh, <coughs> it's also worth pointing out that if the universe was very different than it is, uh, can we, uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, you're worried about this. Yeah, so, so, so these, um, these kind of potentials come straight from a UV, they, they come, for example, from string theory compactifications. So those field are ax fields are axions. Uh, and there's a, there's a shift symmetry, which is why it's a periodic function. It doesn't have to be cosine exactly, but there's a, uh, some kind of periodic function there. Um, so this is still an effective description. It's, it's, the, it's the theory of the moduli. It's a theory of the light degrees of freedom. It's not the whole theory. But, um, but it comes from a, from a UV completion. So it's reasonably solid. Um, yeah, so... so um, Right, so if we lived in a very different universe, like one that had large curvature, let's say we knew the universe was spherical because we could send light rays and they would come back or something, or we, we look at Andromeda and we see it that way and that way because we live on a torus, right? So something like that. Then, uh, uh, or if we looked around and we saw a, a spectrum of perturbations which was totally not scale invariant, maybe we saw galaxies at the vertices of a cubic lattice or something like this, okay? So you can imagine all sorts of crazy scenarios where inflation would certainly not be the right description any theory of inflation. Be careful, maybe someone can come up with one that produces perturbations at vertices of a cubic lattice, but I doubt it. So, so um, in other words, the reason we came to it, the reason people are interested in it, is it does a good job of describing the universe we live in. And you shouldn't hold that against it, that would be absurd, right? Okay, it's hard to falsify now because it does a good job of describing reality. That's not a reason to throw it away. Anyway, so, so I think, um, again, a little bit philosophical, but uh, uh, enough said about that. Um, okay, what about this, initial conditions? Okay, so, um, so what's the issue with these initial conditions? Well, uh, <coughs> one argument is that, let's say you don't want to assume that the whole universe is homogeneous and isotropic before inflation, because that seems really much too much. Um, that's basically assuming the answer. Um, but you do want to say that at the moment that inflation begins, it begins in a patch, so at, at Ti for initial or inflation, uh, that there's a patch, a homogeneous patch, and it's of size 1 over Hi. Okay, so you have a Hubble patch at the beginning of inflation, which is, um, which is homogeneous. So you need that to use uh, any of the approximations we used in deriving this, at least at, at, the, at the beginning. Okay, so let's say you just want to assume that, and then you ask, what does that mean about the past? We know what it means about the future, the universe is going to start to inflate. But what does it mean about the past? So let's go back down towards T Planck. 
Well, we talked about this um, on Monday. Um, you have to assume something about what uh, dominated the universe prior to inflation, before inflation. Well, it certainly wasn't accelerating, because otherwise it would have been inflating. Um, let's say it was radiation dominated, just to, to pick something simple. Um, and then what we saw is that if you extrapolate back, I should start with one Hubble patch, sorry. So here's my initial Hubble patch, so this is this one over HI in size. And now let me extrapolate back. What we learned was that this contains many disconnected causal regions. And if you plug in the constraint on how big that can be, and you ask how many of these regions are there, you get something like 10 to the 9. So a billion Hubble regions, Hubble volumes at T Planck. So if you needed this to be homogeneous on the Hubble scale at the beginning of inflation, you would have had to assume that in the early universe, you had this vastly superhorizon region, which was homogeneous. And that certainly doesn't sound good, because again, the whole point of inflation was to explain why the universe today doesn't have this problem, right? This is the horizon problem. So, um, so yeah, if you really needed to assume this, if you really needed to assume that there was this homogeneous patch and that you could just smoothly evolve it back, uh, you would run into this problem. Uh, and, and there wasn't a very good counter argument to this because if you assume anything other than that, then it's hard. So if you don't have any homogeneous patches in the universe, then the universe is very inhomogeneous. And since gravity is nonlinear, it acts on those inhomogene inhomogeneities in complicated ways. It forms black holes, forms horizons. There's going to be singularities that develop. And you, you can't use perturbation theory. So the standard tool of cosmology, which works well when you're close to FRW, is to treat all the perturbations well, is to, is to have small perturbations and then expand in them, right, to do, do perturbation theory. Um, if you don't have that, if you have large fluctuations, big inhomogeneities, you can't use perturbation theory. You can't do anything analytically, basically, because Einstein's equations are too hard to solve. So you've got to do it numerically. But until relatively recently, like 10 or 15 years ago, um, even solving Einstein's equations numerically was impossible when black holes form. Um, now, but thanks to all the work that uh, people like Franz Pretorius and the uh, compact object community has put in, we now have numerical codes which can handle the formation of horizons and even things like colliding black holes. So it can handle GR in, quote unquote, the strong field regime, the regime where there are horizons. So, um, and some of those codes, so some of these black hole merger codes, use periodic boundary conditions. I don't know if they all do, but some of them use periodic boundary conditions. If you have periodic boundary conditions in three dimensions, there's a name for that manifold. It's T3, topologically. Three torus. Okay. So um, what does it mean? It means that what those codes are simulating is a universe, which is T3 uh, times time. This is a cosmology, according to the definition I gave at the very beginning. So we can use those same codes to simulate early universe cosmology in a situation where we don't assume anything about any homogeneity. So we can take initial conditions which are dominated by gradients, by inhomogeneities. So if we have our scalar fields, we could make del phi squared, spatial grad phi squared, the largest term in the energy. Okay, so that means that there are big inhomogeneities in phi. And then we can stick that into the computer. We can do that and run it um, and see what comes out. Uh, <clears throat> so here's another research opportunity. Take a numerical GR code and study cosmology with it. People are starting to do this, uh, but just starting, really. Mostly those codes are used for black hole mergers, for good reason. Those black hole mergers are very interesting, and it's a, obviously a very timely topic. But um, again, those same codes can very easily be adapted to study cosmology. <clears throat> 
um, and problems in, uh, uh, in cosmology. All right, so what do you find if you do this? Um, well, you find that essentially all the time, although you started with a very inhomogeneous universe, so you did not have a large, it looked like you were going to have a large super horizon homogeneous patch. That's what this argument seemed to imply. But if you start from here, without that, with everything dominated by inhomogeneities, and you evolve forward, you find that you always, or almost always, produce patches like that, and inflation begins. So inflation starts anyway. And this, by the way, is work with Leonardo, and Will East, and Andre Linde. Um, OK, so, so, um, so why is it? Well, basically, it's because when you have inhomogeneities, they tend to clump. Gravity is attractive. Inhomogeneities collapse into black holes in these simulations because there's nothing to stop them from forming black holes. But they collapse into gravitationally bound, dense regions. And meanwhile, the rest of the universe goes on expanding and sort of leaves them behind. And eventually, it consists of a bunch of voids, which are empty and homogeneous, with a kind of dust scattered about, which are these black holes. And so when those voids get large enough, it's this kind of patch, and inflation begins. So it's very much not FRW. Um, it's not homogeneous, but inflation begins anyway. There are some caveats. Um, you need large field inflation to make this very generic. Uh, and you need, so it depends on your potential. If your potential has, I don't know, some region that's suitable for inflation and some region that isn't, like down here, then if you start with a field that's homogeneous and sitting in the minimum, you're not going to inflate. Um, but if you start with a field which has large fluctuations in it, but its average value is somewhere up there, then you will. OK, so it, it's not like inflation always happens. Um, what does always happen is you always form homogeneous regions, but it's not guaranteed that those will begin to inflate. It depends a bit on the inflationary potential. There has to be one, and on the uh, initial conditions for phi. If you have a small field inflation model, it's harder. It turns out in a situation like this, that even if the average value in space of the inflaton is sitting on the inflationary plateau, and so if the universe was homogeneous, it would inflate, if the fluctuations are big enough so that in some part of the universe, the field is over there, then this large gradient over here pulls the average down into the minimum rather efficiently. And so that can prevent inflation from beginning. So it's certainly not the case that all inflation models inflate all the time with any initial condition. That's certainly not true. What is true, though, is that um, initial conditions, which without inflation would have produced a universe that looks nothing like the one we live in. It would have been very inhomogeneous, highly curved, et cetera. So initial conditions like that, um, in many cases, will still uh, begin to inflate if there's an inflationary potential, and then produce a universe like the one we live in. Okay, so in other words, inflation does solve the horizon and flatness problem, problems for at least some set of initial conditions. All right, so that's uh, what I want to say about that. I have five more minutes? Okay. <coughs> Questions? Okay, so, uh, yep. No, these don't include any quantum effects. That's another, that's hard. <laughs> So I'm not going to write it. But uh, if you're brave, you could try to, try to include quantum effects. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm starting after the Planck time when it's at least plausible that quantum effects are small. Um, but still, it might be interesting to try to include them. Um, OK. Um, can I just repeat? Ah, you mean, yeah, so, so um, well, let, let, me, let me run it starting from, from the initial time, 
So let me start with a universe that's very inhomogeneous. So it doesn't have any smooth patches on any scale. Um, certainly not on super horizon scales. Run so what happens is that the, um, the large inhomogeneities do something complicated. There's lots of dynamics. But they tend to clump together after a while. So in other words, regions with high density tend to clump together because they attract each other. So they may orbit. They may fly around for a while. But eventually, they attract each other. And they attract each other a lot. They form a black hole, okay, at least in this simulation, which only contains a scalar. So there's not much pressure to prevent them from forming a black hole. So they form a black hole, sometimes more than one. Um, meanwhile, so those regions stop expanding because they're inside a black hole or near it. But the regions around them, which have been sort of evacuated by this black hole pulling the, the overdensities into them, those regions expand and they grow. And so after a while, this three torus, it has some complicated metric on it. It's not at all homogeneous. It's, it's got black holes in it. But it contains these big voids, which are empty of much of anything. And in those voids, after a while, after they get sufficiently empty, you'll be dominated by VFI, even though VFI was a very small component of the energy density originally. Well, it actually is going on today. Yeah, because of dark energy. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the point is a, a few black holes don't prevent inflation from starting. Actually, we know that now. There's plenty of black holes in the universe, and yet the universe is expanding exponentially. Right, so a few small black holes are just some kind of very minor pollution. Uh, inflation doesn't care. It's something that takes place on much larger scales than that. Of course, this is more interesting than that because there are large perturbations on horizon scales from the beginning. So it's less obvious what will happen, but that's what happens. Yeah. Um, the tuning for the initial conditions, you mean, for inflation to happen? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, it's Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, OK. It's, it's hard to put a number to it, because to put a number to it, you have to assign a probability to a given initial condition. You need to measure on the space of initial conditions. And um, once you've done that, there's a definite answer for the tuning. But people can come and argue with your choice of measure, right? So there's, there's no canonic, there's more than one canonical way to do that. <laughs> Let me say it like that. So, so uh, in, in this simulation, what was done was to take the initial perturbations, the initial um, value of phi, to be um, a sum of sine waves with random coefficients and random phases. Uh, and so when I say random, that was with some uniform distribution over some range. OK, so, so within that set, it almost always underwent inflation. But there are obviously points in that set where it would not. For instance, if all the coefficients are 0 and the field is sitting at its minimum, then it won't inflate because there's nothing to drive it. So um, yeah, so, so, so how probable is that? Well, not very probable if you're choosing these things uniformly. But if you think that the point where it's sitting in the minimum is much more probable. So you have to have a measure on your, on your set of initial conditions. So it's, it's hard to answer that question. All I can really say is that there's an open set of initial conditions which without an inflationary potential would have given rise to a very inhomogeneous universe that with this inflationary potential give rise to a very homogeneous universe. So it certainly solves the flatness and horizon problems for those initial conditions. That's the thing you can say for sure. All right. So, um, well, OK. Uh, I guess this will remain. This is good because this fits nicely into uh, the bigger picture. Um, so what we'll do next time. We'll talk about eternal inflation, um, the cosmological constant problem. Um, so I understand that, uh, that Claudia did a great job explaining dark energy and telling you about models of dark energy, but she didn't tell you how to solve the cosmological constant problem. So I'll tell you how to solve it. Um, and, um, and I'll solve it with a landscape, so I'll tell you how that works. Um, and, and part and parcel of that is eternal inflation. So we'll talk about that. So this is both a problem and an opportunity in some sense. Um, and then uh, I'll give you some more ideas for, uh, for research opportunities and, and try to give you sort of an overview of where we are right now. So thank you.